Hello and welcome to the Legends of Opera, where we shall be delving into the lives of the incredible singers who have given us the heritage of opera. Dame Kiri Takanawa is a name as grand as any in the world of operatic sopranos. She is the ultimate package. She has the most beautiful voice, immaculate technique, and musicianship. God, she made some beautiful noises. It sent shivers down your spine. I think the word that always springs to mind when I think about describing her in any way is elegance. An experienced opera and recording artist, Kiri Takanawa was equally at home in front of the camera as on the stage. She had a wonderfully rich, creamy soprano. And the sort of roles that she excelled in were Mozart and Strauss. Her roles on the world's most prominent stages and high-profile performances to TV audiences of millions propelled Kiri Takanawa out of the opera house and into homes across the world. She was a great singer, a great actress, and had this incredible voice, a magnificent voice. But she also had this real mental toughness that meant she was able to survive the cutthroat world of opera. She's um, a very strong-willed lady, and she knows what she wants. Terry DeCano was more like a tenor in terms of her career. She didn't have anybody that she sort of fainted on or fell back on. She made her career, she called the shots, all of that. An artist of poise and versatility, with a voice as recognizable as any soprano of the last century, Dame Kiri Takanawa remains a legend of opera. I think the idea of opera legends applies to Kiri because her name will live for hundreds of years, I'm quite sure of that. Dame Kiri Takanawa was born Claire Mary Theresa Rostron in March 1944 in Gisborne, New Zealand. Adopted by Thomas and Nell Takanawa in her infancy, she was renamed Kiri at the age of five months. Both Kiri's biological and adoptive father were Maori, something Kiri was proud of but didn't always find easy. Kiri grew up with her adoptive parents in the countryside. She said that it was quite an idyllic life. They went out to fish quite a lot. But at the same time, there was a lot of racism that she suffered as a mixed-race child, and some of the neighbours were quite cruel, and it did really affect her. When Kiri was 11, the family moved to Auckland, and she went to St Mary's College and was taught there by Sister Mary Leo and it was rather a tough regime under the nuns. But they did foster her love of music, but also by this point, she's also having private music lessons as well because her talent is very obvious. She was a rather wild, undisciplined child, Kiri, um, but she was enthralled. This nun really meant business and taught her, the, taught her the roots, and Kiri remained very, very grateful. The result was that she was singing on television talent shows and giving little concerts in New Zealand when she was 16, 17. She was on the radio, she made records, she sang in clubs. Uh, she was just a sensation. She was beautiful, she had this incredible voice, she was different. 
and she just became sort of like the pop queen of New Zealand. She was doing a lot of popular singing uh, in New Zealand, uh, but it was actually a chance meeting with Richard Bonning, who later of course, married Joan Sutherland, which changed the course of her career because he, it was he who suggested to her that she wasn't a mezzo-soprano, which is what she had trained as, but actually that she was a soprano. She also made a recording of the Singing Nuns, and that was New Zealand's first gold record. But really, her voice was so extraordinary that it was almost bigger than what New Zealand had to offer her. In 1965, the singer entered and won the Mobile Song Quest competition. This gave her the opportunity to study in London. A year later, Kiri Takanawa became a pupil at the prestigious London Opera Centre. The London Opera Centre was set up by Joan Cross, who was a very famous British soprano in the post-war years. It was run out of Covent Garden, although it was in East London, Stepney, it was run by the Royal Opera House and in many ways was a sort of precursor to the young singer programmes that they have running even today. I do think it was quite difficult for Kiri when she first arrived in London because she'd been a superstar in New Zealand, she'd been so popular. And now in London, no one really knew who she was. A lot of people didn't even know where New Zealand was. And so she really was back at square one and treated like just another pupil. She is, by her own confession, all over the place when she's there. She turns up late the whole time and really a, 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 a bit of a mess and nobody thinks she's going to get anywhere because she's just not professional enough. But the voice is something else. Dame Kiri became the pupil of the great Hungarian soprano Vera Rosa, who was teaching at this point in her career. Um, she was famous uh, for being able to listen to your voice and see what the problem was. She worked a lot on her top register as well. Um, Sister Mary Leo had worked on this lovely, beautiful, creamy lower register. It was the top that really opened up her career. She really did transform Kiri from more of a popular singer to the great opera singer that she was. She also met Sir George Salty while she was in London, and he was a great influence over her life as well. He saw the talent in this very raw, very young girl. It's always a pleasure to present a new and exciting talent on my show, and tonight we have a young soprano from the Covent Garden Opera Company, for whom I predict a great future. Here to sing Puccini's lovely aria, Chi il bel sogno di Daretta, is a beautiful Kiri Tikanawa. Kiri made her debut on the London stage in Sadler's Wells in 1968, and she first played the second lady in Mozart's Magic Flute, and then she's in Dido and Aeneas, and she was a great success. And this was really what made her able to move on and get a contract at Covent Garden, a three-year contract, which she was delighted with. What was significant in her time at the London Opera Centre was that she auditioned for Covent Garden, not, not once, not twice, but nine times which tells you something about Kiri's character, her persistence. In those days, Covent Garden uh, had a lot more singers on permanent year-round contracts than they do now. And she was offered one of these contracts, which was a very, very wise investment from their point of view. And she makes her debut in a, in a small but telling role in um, Boris Godunov. The conductor at Covent Garden there was Colin Davis, who heard her and said, 
He had never heard a more beautiful voice in his life. And if you think about it, Dame Carey and Covent Garden, in many ways, almost seemed like they were made for each other. I think that one of the great things about Kiri is that she has always shown this um, extraordinary interest in the development of, of young singers because she herself was nurtured here at Covent Garden and she was supported and cared for and um, given, you know, fantastic opportunities. She was um, a flower maiden, of course, that was her, her debut here. My first experience of uh, Kiri was in Arabella Covent Garden. It was just an extraordinary experience. The part that I played was, you know, not a huge one, but, but it, it was a very big duet and it was a throw for me, I must say. Her singing is really quite immaculate. It's unique when she sings, even though, I mean, I've known her for a very long time indeed. When I hear her now, I'm always struck by the same characteristics. I mean, she's a very calm performer. You know, when you get to be anything like as famous and popular as she is, you usually see a certain amount of tension and nervousness, keeping the standards high. But she can do it so easily. During her time as part of the company at the Royal Opera House and under the tutelage of John Copley, Kiri began studying for the role that became synonymous with her career. John Copley was a great director at the time, much in demand, and he prepared her for the role of the Countess in The Marriage of Figaro by Mozart. However, Tekanoa would have to bide her time before making her much-anticipated debut at the Royal Opera House. Having spent the past four years at the London Opera Centre, Kiri Takanawa had been learning the part of the Countess in Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro. But before she could perform the role on the coveted Royal Opera House stage, Takanawa would cut her teeth in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Santa Fe is a lovely summer festival. Not as much pressure, not as much media pressure as you get here in London. But then following the success there, she was engaged by Sir Colin Davis to sing it at Covent Garden in December 1971. I can remember reading the reviews of this new production of Marriage of Figaro when I was an opera mad teenager and thinking, I have got to go to this. So I queued up and I got a standing place for I think what must have been the third or fourth performance and she was staggering that night. It was absolutely gobsmackingly wonderful. And I remember when she sang her big act three aria, Dove Sono, at the end of it, she leaves the stage. And it was one of those occasions which genu the, the show genuinely stopped. The applause went on and on and on and on. They couldn't, the conductor kept lifting up his baton to start the music again, and the audience would not stop applauding. A star was born. Having announced herself to the opera world with her stunning performance at the Royal Opera House in December 1971, Dame Kiritakanawa was now hot property and would soon take her next step towards international stardom. After her fantastic countess in The Marriage of Figaro, Kiri was signed on for a series of Mozart operas for tour and she set off and played in the Opera de Lyon. She also played Mimi in La Boheme. So she really was launched onto the opera world. Her next big success was she sang Desdemona in Otello for Scottish Opera in Glasgow. And I think that was also, I think, very significant for her because it, it sort of proved that she wasn't just a one-trick pony, that um, it wasn't simply that she'd had Colin Davis conducting her and John Copley directing her in Figaro, and that was why she was so good. Um, that she, she was going to have staying power, and boy, did she have staying power.
As it happens, I was in the audience when she first sung Desdemona, which was a Scottish opera, and we were all quite excited to uh, to see what it was going to be like. And I thought it was absolutely splendid. I mean, first of all, she looked like a million dollars. was absolutely the right character for Desdemona. She understood it. And when it came to the big scenes that she has, particularly at the end, I mean, they were rapturous. And I'm not exaggerating, it was just amazing. Glyndebourne in East Sussex, home of the Glyndebourne Festival Opera. Founded by John Christie in 1934, the festival at Glyndebourne has welcomed stars such as Luciano Pavarotti, Joan Sutherland, and Mirella Frani to perform. Kiri Takanawa would join this illustrious list when in 1973, she was asked to reprise her role as the Countess in Peter Hall's production of The Marriage of Figaro. I was 10 years old and I remember it vividly, sitting in a little box in the old theatre um, on the side of the auditorium um, where we could sneak in and out if we wanted to, um, which was quite often. Um, but when Kiri was singing Poggio Amor in, in the beginning of Act Three, I was spellbound. crazy idea to build an opera house in the middle of the Sussex countryside, but it worked. It started as a 300-seater, and then it, it grew over the years, and, and as, as demand for tickets got more, it grew to an auditorium of 830 seats. And then my dad took over in the early 60s. The 80s was, was a golden era for Glyndebourne, and we had Peter Hall and Bernard Heiting as the music and artistic directors. So much so that, that, that um, he needed to build a bigger theater. And that's what he did. Word soon got around that there was something special going on down here at Glyndebourne. And so people got on the train in black tie and came to experience um, the magic of Glyndebourne. News travels fast in the opera business, and when Teresa Stratus, who was the leading soprano at the Met, went ill for a production of Otello, they called on Kiri at very short notice. Of course, she already knew the role because she played Desdemona in Glasgow, so she had it, she knew it, but here she was doing it in New York, and the critics were delighted. They thought she was a great actress, they loved her voice. very fair. The credit goes to her, not the Met, uh, or anybody else, because when she arrived and made her debut in any particular house, it was of the same standard, which is very, very rare. I can't tell you how rare it is. Kiri Takanawa would gain even more attention when she performed on the Royal Opera House stage with one of opera's greatest male stars for Puccini's La Boheme. 
It was a great moment for Kiri when she sang in the role of Mimi in La Boheme opposite Pavarotti, his great performance, his great role, and the pair of them at Covent Garden. I mean, what a ticket that must have been. Kiri Takano as Mimi and Pavarotti as her great lover. What an incredible performance. Boheme was one of his specialities, Rodolfo. Mimi suited her very nicely with that sort of uh, full lyric soprano that she had and their bohem at Covent Garden was well thought of. In 1979, she makes Don Giovanni for the great Joseph Lossi. It's a wonderful record of her voice and her acting ability and her beauty at that age and that stage. She plays uh, Donna Elvira, and I think that was her greatest role, actually. I've never heard that role sung better than she sang it. And it's a great film. It's a great film, one of the few really good opera films. One of Tikhanova's most significant influences throughout her career was Hungarian conductor Sir George Scholti. Kiri had met George Scholte when she was very young and they continued their working relationship throughout her life. They had private lessons, he, really, he was really very fond of her and her voice. Scholte absolutely adored her and he made with her a recording of The Marriage of Figaro, which I think is the best recording. If you want to explain to anybody the magic of Kiri, I would direct them to that recording. She sings absolutely beautifully on it. really was a very significant recording, a big bestseller, much loved, and seen by many as the definitive Figaro recording. By the end of the 1970s, Kiri Takanawa had established herself as one of the most prominent soprano stars in opera. But it would be the invitation to perform in front of a worldwide television audience of millions that catapulted the singer to global fame. The peak of her fame, of course, was singing the, the Bright Seraphim by Handel at Prince Charles and Diana Spencer's wedding in 1981. And she just caught the imagination of the world. The resonance of the cathedral was wonderful and the whole event, everybody was so um, lit up by it, but of course it was going to be a great success. I believe it was a personal invitation by Prince Charles for her to sing at, at the, the wedding. Charles has always been a great supporter of the arts, had a great interest in opera, so he would have been aware of her performances at Covent Garden. And it was joyous, it was absolutely joyous, it was terrific. Many people who had never heard of opera, who'd never heard of Kiri because they simply weren't interested in opera, were watching her and fell in love with her and her voice. To sing that aria in St Paul's Cathedral in 81, that, that was a big deal and it really made a, an impact on public consciousness. She was seen by 600 million people which probably is the record for any opera singer ever in the history of the world to ever have been heard. In 1982, the year after the wedding, Kiri Takanawa was appointed the Dame Commander of the British Empire. So after then, her title was Dame Kiri Takanawa. And what a great moment that was.
Kiri Takanawa returned to the Royal Opera House stage in 1983 to perform alongside Placido Domingo in Puccini's Manon Lesco. They are a great sensation, of course, as you can imagine. It's a perfect role for her and, and, and perfect uh, uh, opera for them. Unfortunately, she rather fell out with the conductor, Giuseppe Sinopoli, who really couldn't work with her. He was finding it very difficult. And certainly, uh, by this point, Kiri definitely wanted to do things her way. She didn't necessarily want to take a huge amount of artistic and creative direction. So there did become some friction between her and some of the directors, as there was with most of the great opera stars. Shortly after that run of performances, Sinopoli recorded Manon Lesko. It wasn't Kiri Takanoa on the recording. They used Mirella Frani instead. So obviously, Sinopoli thought she was uh, a difficult person. Some sopranos are very whimsical and capricious. Kiri wasn't like that. Kiri had, was very, very much had her own ideas about what she wanted to do and what she didn't want to do. And some conductors just didn't find her very collegial or very collaborative. I think that's a fair thing to say. I feel pretty, oh so pretty. I feel pretty and witty and bright. One conductor who was keen to work with Takanawa was Leonard Bernstein. And in 1984, he approached her to take part in the recording of an operatic version of West Side Story. Bernstein would conduct his music for the first time. I feel I'm so pretty that I hardly can The interpretation is, is fantastic in that he can he pulls things out and puts them in, but the funniest thing of, of all when he suddenly just started just conducting and he just said, that's the tempo, that's it. And I sort of laugh because that was like having Mozart with you or bring Handel back and says, that's what I wanted, that's the tempo and that's how it shall be. And you were getting it from the mask himself, fantastic. His lyrical music, you just have to lay back with the sound and sing through the words and not be too precise. Not that his music should not have precision, but in order to sing that sort of music, to make it sell and to make it, it live his way, you have to just lay back and sing it like it's, I don't know, it's just, it just goes on forever. In 1985, Kiri Takanawa would team up once again with Sir George Schulte for his debut at the Royal Opera House in a performance of Richard Strauss's Der Rosenkavalier. Many believe that John Schlesinger's production captured Tekanawa at her very best and ranks as one of her finest achievements. Kiri was superb in those Mozart and Strauss roles. There was something about the creaminess of the soprano, the long legato lines that she could spin out, uh, made her very appropriate for that sort of repertoire. She has that poise, you know, that elegance, and the suggestion of the Viennese style that he's so good at. She makes the most beautiful noises when she sings Richard Strauss's music, because it suits her voice very, very well. Throughout the 1980s, Kiri Takanawa would continue to delight opera audiences in some of the biggest productions across the globe. But it would be in 1991 that Takanawa reached popular music chart success. In 
1991, Kiri sang the Rugby World Cup song, World in Union, and that got to number four in the UK singles chart. So once more, she's really bringing her voice to the big popular audience. By the 1990s, Dame Kiri Takanawa was a household name and one of the most popular singers in the operatic world. She would continue to perform in operas and concerts, guaranteeing sell-out audiences wherever she played. On her 50th birthday, uh, a concert was given at the Albert Hall and she very kindly asked me to be one of the guests and uh, she suggested that we sing the love scene at the end of Act One of La Boheme. The closing of that scene was the bit I enjoyed most, it was the duet. And to have the opportunity to sing that duet with her on her birthday in this very important venue, broadcast all over the world, was a very special moment for me. Although she had this global fame, her career was very much concentrated in Britain, the USA and Australia and New Zealand. She did sing in Europe, but they didn't really take to her in the same way that the Anglophone countries took to her. Some people may ask, why has La Scala sort of been remiss uh, in relation to Dame Keery? It's a personal opinion, but I think that Dame Keery came into the sort of opera world at a juncture that maybe now that we look back, we can kind of see it. She was a kind of a pop star in, a, in, in New Zealand. She was a hard worker. Uh, she didn't come up in a way in the kind of uh, Italian house, the sort of, uh, so if you go from opera house to opera house, the sort of great sort of shape that you go up. I think in a way she didn't fit the kind of shape or sense of the La Scala audience. They missed a trick. You look at the main rep that she sang, the Mozart and Strauss, that's not so important to the, the Milanese. Um, so... It, it's more about Italian rep, and, she, and Kiri sang less Verdi and Puccini than Mozart and Strauss. Nineteen ninety-seven was a particularly difficult year for Kiri Takanawa. She and her husband broke up after thirty years of marriage, and also the death of Diana hit her hard. She said she never sang. Uh, the bright seraphim ever again after Princess Diana's death. She said she put the song away, that was the end of it for her. And also within a week of Princess Diana's death, George Schulte also passed away. So that was really heartbreaking. Following these tragedies, Dame Kiri Takanawa dedicated herself not only to her singing, but to the development and careers of young singers. In the early 2000s, Kiri continued singing, 
but she also established the Kiwi Takanoa Foundation with the aim of encouraging young New Zealand singers to, to train, to develop their voices and to really make an international stage for themselves in the way that she had done. She really cares deeply about the way in which they're nurtured, the way in which they're supported. Are they getting the right kind of advice? Are they seeing the right kind of doctors? Um, are they singing the right kind of repertoire? And it, with, with someone like Kiri, she is herself a model and, and uh, an inspiration to those younger singers. So she, she, she's a great character here. She has devoted a lot of her time to helping uh, New Zealand singers like her who've come over here, basically. She exerts quite a lot of control over them. She's like a sort of mother hen, but she's also been enormously generous and I think the foundation has done great work. I know that one of her singers is the young British soprano, uh, Louise Alder. And if Louise gives a recital at Wigmore Hall, you can bet your bottom dollar that Kiri's going to be there in the audience to support her and cheer her on. She is very supportive of her young singers. We have some young singers who have sung here, Louise Alder, who sang the role of Sophie this year in Rosen Cavalier, is a recipient of, of one of her foundation's awards. She wants to pass on her talents to, to the next generation, which is very laudable, and I think um, she enjoys teaching young singers. She is a wonderful person for young people to take an interest in and learn from. Towards the latter part of her career, Dame Kiri appeared in more light-hearted roles. She played a tiny part as Nellie Melba, the great Australian singer in Downton Abbey in 2013. She had a tiny part where she's at the table and she suddenly starts singing. Suddenly you realize, my God, that's Carrie DeCanova and she's singing. And she's performed many roles over the years, right through to 2014, when she performed the speaking role in uh, La Fille du Regiment. So she, again, she's got this tremendous degree of attachment um, to people here. When it was first presented, the, the Duchess was played by Dawn French, the comedian, who came on and did a, a very funny skit. And when they revived it a few years later, Kiri was invited to come and be the, the Duchess. You could tell she was having a laugh, which is in the spirit of the piece. In 2017, Kiri Takanawa said she was retiring. She said, I want to hear the fresh voices. I don't want to hear my voice anymore. I want to hear these young, new voices. And I really want to step aside so that they can take on the stage. I've been thinking about this for quite a number of years. And I thought that when I got to 50, that it would be happening. And then when I got 55, maybe, and I moved on to 60, and I thought, oh, well, it's still here. So I, I think I've sort of been thinking about it for a long time, but never knowing how I would actually say goodbye. For me, the best role that Kiri Takanawa ever sang was her Desdemona. I think she captured the complexity of Desdemona, the vulnerability of Desdemona. She had the voice, she had the look, and she had the personality and she had the acting to play Desdemona. So I think that, for me, was her greatest role. For me, her best role is uh, Elvira in Don Giovanni. Her, her Mozart singing is altogether wonderful. Uh, the magic flute really just, I, I think, just can't be bettered. I think her best role, the role she's known for, is as the Countess in The Marriage of Figaro.
It has all the elements of her, her comic, you know, sort of abilities, the sort of switcheroo that she has to do, and the beautiful arias she has to sing. She sang it a lot, and there's a reason why. I mean, she's just perfect for it. The Countess was probably her most significant role at the start of her career, but the role which probably defined her was the Marshalline in Der Rosen Cavalier. I think her Strauss was just different. The Rosen Cavalier and Arabella and all these other things. So classy. You know, it could have been written for her. She had the long legato line, she had that rich, creamy sound, which was just perfect for Strauss's music. Strauss adored the soprano voice. I think Strauss would have loved Kiri singing as the Marshallin. A complete master of Mozart and Strauss, and a star in any opera in which she performed, Dame Kiri Takanawa's name is celebrated. Her incredible voice and presence on the opera stages of the world ensure that she will forever remain a legend of opera. <laughs>